Good morning, everyone. Greetings. Merry Christmas. Yes. Yes. So, it's, uh, listen, I, before I start my message, I will take this coat off because I have way too much respect for that pulpit and for the Bible. And um, if, if I were you, I wouldn't take me serious if I had this coat on. So, um, I totally understand. But I was glad to see Michael put his sweater back on. Thank you for that, Michael, because I kind of shamed him. I kind of shamed him because he took it off in the first gathering and left me kind of isolated by myself with this ridiculous coat on. And I say ridiculous, but then I look in the back and Jay's got one on that's very similar to this. So actually, you look really good in that, Jay, but I'm the one that looks ridiculous. So, but it, was started out as, it started out as this um, Christmas sweater Sunday, and somehow the narrative changed to ugly Christmas sweater Sunday. And I was like, wait, what do I do? So I just went with Christmas sweater blazer. I was trying to say it wasn't ugly, but some of you, whatever. All right, so open your Bibles. Matthew chapter 2. Hope has arrived. It's our Christmas theme. And, um, and so as we get into Matthew chapter 2, we're going to see more of this Christmas story. Now, if I asked you, what is the Christmas story about? Likely all of us could give basically the same general answer. Well, it's about the birth of Jesus Christ. And we would be correct in that, but we're not entirely correct in that, uh, meaning there's more to it than that. Um, but, you know, the, um, the, the songs that we, some of the songs that we sing and some of the traditions that we hold regarding the Christmas story are actually a bit inaccurate as well. And I don't want to ruin anybody's Christmas or, like, take away from some of these traditions. But, I mean, so, so think, about, think about this this first song, Silent Night. I mean, it's so beautiful. You know, you get some people singing it with some harmonies, and you're like, oh, that's so beautiful. But, but if you think about it just a little bit, you're like, wait a second. Um, there's supposed to be, because we know a little bit about the Christmas story, there's supposed to be these angels that are making this big announcement, and there's these shepherds who are so surprised, and there's all these animals, and not to mention, there's a woman giving birth. And it's a silent night. I kind of don't think so. And then, and then the, the next song that we sing is kind of contradicts the silent night thing because it's away in a manger. And again, it's so precious. It's just so special. Away in a manger and the cattle are lowing, which means they're mooing a whole bunch. And they wake the baby up, but the baby doesn't cry. And all of you moms are like, right. We don't believe that one either. And then we get to the three kings, of course, the we three kings of Orient are, and it's got a kind of a cool feel to it. And you're like, yeah, that's great, except they're not actually kings. And we have no idea how many there were. We get the, we get the thought that there's three of them because of the gifts that they give, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but there could have been 30 of them. We don't know. Actually, truth, there are not three isolated guys traveling to Bethlehem. There's probably a great big entourage of them, which is why they got the, the attention of Herod the king and all of that sort of thing. So you're like, and, and let's, let's take that just a little bit further. So there, there's these three kings, wise men, who are traveling from, from where they were traveling from to Jerusalem, then to Bethlehem, and now you picture the nativity scene, and you're like, yeah, my nativity scene, it's so precious, it's special. Ours is right next to our fireplace, and you're like, look at that. One, they're not kings. Okay, we just blew that up. Ah, and then there's not, we're not sure that there's three of them, but so we don't know what to do with that, but the reality is they never were at the manger scene. When we read the, today's text, we find out that Jesus is not a baby any longer. He's a child. And the family's in a house, not in some sort of a barn. <laughs> so now you guys are like, what, i got to get rid of my nativity scene? No, just part of it, just part of it. <laughs> just take a couple of those little figurines and, you know. No, you could keep it. It's still special and fun, but we don't have it all right. And there's one other spot, there's one other area where I don't think we have the full story, Christmas story, one part that we haven't quite got right, because we think it's just like this isolated thing about the birth of Jesus. But the Christmas story is not just 
this small little story about the birth of Jesus. It's actually, the Christmas story is all about who Jesus is. Like all of who Jesus is. And Matthew tells us that from the very beginning. He, he tips us off that there's a way bigger story that's taking place here than the birth of this child in Bethlehem. So, as, as again, we're, we're, we're studying the gospel of Matthew, and one of the things that we're going to find out as we continue through Matthew's gospel into the new year is that one of his dominant themes is the kingdom of heaven. So he uses this, this term, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, he uses them interchangeably. The kingdom of heaven is, is, he's talking about that more than any of the other gospel writers. Like he has this big picture view and this very dominant theme of what's going on, and he presents Jesus as the king of the kingdom. And he does this at the very beginning in the Christmas story. So we're going to see this as we get into this this morning. Now, we don't normally include that part, that big picture part kind of in this Christmas story. We keep it a little bit smaller, but it's a bigger picture. And, but Matthew includes this idea of kingship right from the very beginning of his gospel. So I want to do a quick review because each of these messages that we've had in the gospel of Matthew has, is kind of building on one after the other and they kind of come together this morning. So let's do a quick review of our weeks up to this point. So week one, we studied Jesus' gene genealogy. So we looked at the genealogical record and what that meant, that Jesus is the fulfillment of these long-standing solemn promises known as covenants that God has established with, he established one with Abraham and one with David, but we recognized in that sermon that reality is th those were solemn covenants with those two men, but they're actually like universal covenants, that we're all included in those covenants and in the promises that God has made through those. So, so God, promises, God promises David that somebody's going to come in his lineage who will be an eternal king, not just the king of Israel, not just the king for a particular period of time, but an eternal king who will sit on an eternal throne. And he promises Abraham that the one, this one who would come through his line would be uh, the one who would bless the entire world. So it's an eternal king who would bless the whole world. That's week one, and this is what we discovered. Our big idea that week is that Jesus' story is your story too. That that. The story is Jesus, and we're included in his story. That's what we saw from week one. In week two, we looked at his birth, and we saw from this, uh, from this text in the second part of chapter one, about Jesus' nature, about his mission, and about his heart. So his nature, we saw that it's, again, fulfillment of longstanding ancient prophecy or promises from God, that he foretold what was going to happen, that, that God is the hero of the human story, and he wrote himself into the story, his nature then, Jesus is God and man. He's the divine son of God, God, and he's also human. So his nature is he is the God-man. And his mission was to save his people from their sins. So you have to be his people in order to be saved from your sins. That's what we got. And then we found the heart of God. The heart of God, Jesus has given this name from the ancient prophet Isaiah, that he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. That we found the heart of God from the very, very beginning, before sin and after sin was in this world, he's always wanted to be with his people. He's always wanted to be with us. And he's promised to be with us, and Jesus took care of everything that would hinder us from being with God, intimately, personally, in relationship, and eternally. Jesus took care of it all. It's on his merit. We sang about it this morning. It's on his merit that we stand, not our own. That's really good news, friends. That's really good news. And so our big idea there was knowing the story of Jesus' birth grounds us in God's plan for our own lives. He, that grounds us. When we recognize his nature, his mission, and his heart, it grounds us. It reminds us that we have a place in this world, that we are important. And that's really important for us to grasp, right? So now this week, the big idea is this. To understand your place in his story, you have to come to terms with who Jesus is. To understand your place in his story, you have to come to terms with who Jesus is. And in this account, we're going to see several different groups of people. Of course, we're going to see wise men. 
And we're going to see this man whose name was Herod, who's the king in, in Israel. And then we're going to see this group of people, the scribes and the chief priests. And then we're even going to see some, what we just call them the Jewish people, the people that were Jews living in Jerusalem at this time. And what's interesting is Matthew presents us with these various groups of people in this narrative, and he's telling us, he's showing us that each of these groups of people respond differently to the arrival of this one known as Jesus. They each respond a little bit differently here. And as, here's what I want to challenge you to, since we're together this morning. I want, I want to challenge you to make an honest evaluation as, to, as we study these groups of people. I want you to think about which group you mostly resemble in how you've responded to who Jesus is. And it might be a mixture. You might not say, well, yeah, I'm exactly this one group. There's maybe a mixture. Maybe you're a little bit like this group and a little bit like that group. But make an honest evaluation as to who it is you kind of resemble as uh, as you have responded to Jesus up to this point. So let's read our text, Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and he quotes the prophet Micah here in verse 6, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Verse 7, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, this day and for the gathering that we have, that we can be together for a few moments and consider the truth. Your word is truth, and I ask for your Holy Spirit to help us to grasp, um, help us to reflect, may your spirit reveal to us where we are, and help us to respond to your grace and to your love, and... um, Help us to come to terms, Lord, with who Jesus really is. We thank you for this. We pray it in his name. Amen. So Matthew, again, he's telling us about these various people and how they responded to the key phrase in the whole text. So we get these 12 verses that we're going to work through. But the key phrase is in verse 2, and it's what the, what the, king, the, the wise men are coming for. And it says that they came seeking the one who had been born king of the Jews. So that's the key phrase to the entire text, that Jesus was born king, king of the Jews. And we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. But Matthew kind of forces us here as we look at each of these various groups. He's forcing us to come to terms with Jesus' kingship in our own lives. He's not presenting this as debatable as to whether or not Jesus is the king. He was born king. And what does that mean to each one of us? And he's forcing us to reflect on that. And so this first character that we look at is Herod. And Herod, if you will, he wanted his own story. Herod didn't want there to be a Jesus story. He wasn't, he wasn't, he didn't care about that. He wanted his own story. And in fact, he wanted his story to be the only story. Herod Herod was the appointed king in Israel. We find that in verse 1 here. 
that it's in these days when Herod was the king that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And Herod is the appointed king. He's appointed by the Roman government. So you've got Israel that's a nation. And they've, they're, they're, they're a special group of people. We talked about that in the genealogical record and why that mattered. But in this day, Rome is ruling the known world. And so they're superseding the, the Israeli government here and what's taking place there. And Herod's appointed over them. And Herod was, uh, he was appointed in AD, I'm sorry, in, in 40 BC. And he really didn't gain full power. He didn't get full control of that region until 37 B.C., and he reigned until 4 B.C., and he was really, in some ways, a very remarkable man, very powerful, uh, a ton of ingenuity. He was a master builder, and so you could read history and find about all these incredible buildings and, and, and you know, structures that he, that he built, that he would have, had, had initiated in this, and so he really left his mark in history. In fact, he's the one who rebuilt the Jewish temple. It was finished in 20 B.C. And so Herod, Herod was quite a guy, and he really did leave his mark. But, but Herod was not a good guy. He was, he was a really bad guy, actually. It would be an understatement to say that he was an egotistical tyrant. He was the sort of guy who wanted everything his way. And he was exceptionally domineering and suspicious of everyone. And anybody who would ever try to get in his way, he would take care of them. He would do whatever he had to do in order to keep writing his story the way he wanted it to go. Any threat to his throne was met with blunt and brutal force. At one point in his reign, he actually put to death half of the Jewish Sanhedrin. So Israel had their ruling council called the Sanhedrin, and because they crossed him, he put half of them to death. At another point in history, there were 300 court officials who were killed at his command because, again, they were trying to alter the story that he was trying to write, that he was demanding his way, and so he had them killed. He actually had his own wife executed, his own mother-in-law executed, and three of his own sons executed. He was not a good guy. Scholar and pastor Kent Hughes, in his, in his commentary on the book of Matthew, says this, As he lay dying, Herod arranged for all the noble men of Jerusalem to be killed as soon as his own death was announced so that people might weep instead of rejoice on the day of his death. That's pretty remarkable, huh? Pretty remarkable. You think, wait a second, Brent. You wanted wanted us to reflect and see whether or not we're like him? Well, there are people like him in this world. And maybe none of us have been even remotely to this degree. But see, the thing with Herod is he, he's taking it to the nth degree, but oh, don't all of us have this, this little bit of something inside of us that just wants to order life the way we want it to be? And we just get so frustrated when people want to alter that. We get so, it's just like, don't try to mess up my story. I'm trying to write my story here. I want my story to be the story that's being written because we want to be on the throne. It's like we're going to captain our own ship. We're going to do whatever. There's something inside of every single one of us that wants that. And we, again, we, we would hopefully not be categorized as an egotistical tyrant who would be willing to kill people for the sake of, you know, keeping them from threatening the story that we're telling or we're trying to tell. But there is a little bit of something about Herod in all of us, isn't there? Like Herod's not the only guy there's, a little, there's probably a little bit of Herod in, in every one of us. So when, when things don't go the way we wanted them to go, and that anger rises up inside of us, it's just a little bit of Herod in us. When other people frustrate us, or when we're suspicious, there's just that, it's just like that. There's just a little bit of Herod in us, right? He was threatened by the news of Jesus' birth. That's interesting, isn't it? The word that Matthew employs, look at verse 3. It says that when Herod, the king, heard this, heard of the news of the one-born king of the Jews, he was troubled. 
You go, what? Wait a second. Here's this powerful king who's rightly appointed by the Roman government who hears about a baby that's born and he's threatened by that. The word here is troubled. Interesting word, right? So in Acts 17, it's the same word used to describe the riot that took place. Now you get a sense of how Herod was feeling. It's like there's an internal riot taking place because he hears about the rightful king being born. See, everybody knew of these promises. Everybody knew that God had promised a deliverer to Israel. Herod's the king of Israel. He's the appointed king, but he hears about the one who's born king, and he's threatened by it. And so what he starts to do is he immediately begins to plot to preserve his place. Again, isn't that just like, it's like we don't want to be like Herod, but the truth is we're all a little bit like Herod. As soon as, as soon as we hear that somebody might be bumping us a little bit off course from the story we're trying to write, what do we do? We start plotting. We start figuring out how we're going to do an end around, how we're going to, we're going to correct this. We're not going to let that happen. Whose story are we really writing here? Whose story are we supposed to be in? This is Herod. He's starting to plot to preserve his place. He calls in the chief priests and the scribes, and he wants to know, what is this all about? Where is this one supposed to be born? The prophecy's there. Where is he supposed to be born? And they tell him. And then he sets up this ruse with the wise men. This big entourage comes in. These wise men, these magi, they come in, and, and, he, and he says, hey, hey, hey. He calls them secretly, right? Summons them secretly to find out. Now, he, he just found out that they're born in, that the, the Christ child, the Messiah, was to be born in Bethlehem. So he finds out from them, hey, hey, when did that appear? Down, and oh yeah, was it? so he sends them to Bethlehem under this ruse. It says, hey, when they, when you, once you find him and you do what you're going to do, then come back and tell me so I can go and worship him as well. But we'll find out from next week's text that he was, that this was a plot, right? He, he's not going li- to live with that. He's trying to write his own story here. And so, isn't it, it's like this. There's a lot of people like Herod. Again, maybe not murderous tyrants, but there's a lot of people like like Herod. They want their own story. And they appoint themselves the king of their story. And they work really hard to stay on the throne. And they're hostile to anyone that would suggest that they're not the king. We see people like that all over the place, right? We see it in our neighborhoods. We see it on the news. And sometimes when we look in the mirror, we see these people. There's a lot of people like Herod, right? To one degree or another, there's a lot of people like Herod. So it's kind of a good question, right? Like, who's the rightful heir to the throne of our lives? Who's the rightful heir? Who's in charge? Whose story are we in? Right? Well, this next group, this next group really is a sad group. We just call them the Jewish people. Here in the text, it's the Jews in Jerusalem. Right? And they're stuck in Herod's story. They're stuck in Herod's story. No, knowing what Herod's like, that doesn't surprise us. Having just learned what Herod was like, it's not a surprise to us that the Jewish people respond the way they did. See, they were distressed by the news of Jesus' birth as well. Again, verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So the Jews of Jerusalem, they experienced the same distress that Herod does, but for different reasons. Herod's distressed because he was threatened, because there could be another king other than him. The Jews were distressed because of Herod. See, they were, they were stuck in this egotistical maniac, domineering overlord's story. They were stuck. Herod had created an atmosphere of terror, and people were afraid. They were afraid to think for themselves. They were afraid to have an opinion. They were afraid to do anything for fear of upsetting this tyrant. Unfortunately, there are people who know just what that's like. They live in an abusive relationship where somebody 
where somebody else has asserted themselves as the king on the throne of somebody else's life. And they think they have the right to demand and control. See, that's where the Jews of Jerusalem are. That's why this is a sad group of people. They're stuck in Herod's story. They stayed in Jerusalem. But these are Jewish people who knew all the promises. They knew the covenants. They knew the promises. They've been waiting. At this point in history, there is a massive anticipation. They knew something big was about to happen. They knew. They've been waiting for the Messiah to be born in Bethlehem. They find out that he's born in Bethlehem a mere six miles away from Jerusalem. You'd like to think they would join that big entourage of wise men going down, but they don't. They stay in Jerusalem because they're stuck in Herod's story. They don't, they don't get to be like the wise men who rejoiced exceedingly with great joy when they found, found the baby or the child. They don't get to be that. They're robbed of all of that that could be theirs because they're stuck in somebody else's story. It's a sad group, isn't it? Kind of makes you angry. There's a lot of people that are like the Jewish people here. They're stuck in somebody else's story. They don't like the story. In fact, they hate it. They hate the story. But they feel paralyzed to do anything about it. They're afraid. They've been domineered and abused. And they live with an internal riot. But they're stuck. It's a good question, isn't it? Whose story are we supposed to be in? Are we supposed to be in somebody else's story? So we've seen Herod who wants his own story. We've seen these Jewish people who are stuck in Herod's story. Now this next group, this next group is not a sad group. It's an aggravating group. They're an aggravating people, the Jewish leaders, because they're not interested in Jesus' story. Here we're introduced to a group of people that are going to be with us through the duration of Matthew's gospel. He calls them the chief priests and the scribes. They're the Jewish leaders here. Now, these are powerful people, these leaders, the Jewish leaders, the chief priests and the scribes. The chief priests were, they had, they had the oversight of the temple, and remember that the temple, this is, this is set up, even though Rome is overseeing and overruling Israel, Israel is set up internally as a theocracy where God is the one who says what's right and wrong. And God is the one whose will is supposed to prevail. And so the Jewish laws are, the Jewish laws are not just religious things for them. They're social things. They're civil things. The laws that they had in their religion were the laws of the land as well. And so these chief priests are in charge. They get, they're given oversight of the temple, and that's the very nucleus of this whole society. Jerusalem is the capital, and right in the center of Jerusalem is the temple, and that's where all of their festivities and all of their feasts and all of their worship and all of those things took place. People would come from all over Palestine, all over the world to worship in Jerusalem and to worship in the temple, and the chief priests are the ones who have oversight of that. It's a very powerful group of people. And then the scribes were the ones who were the official interpreters of Hebrew Scripture. So it's not just, again, it's not just a religious thing. These are the lawyers. These are the powerful. These are the power brokers in this culture. These people knew the Bible. They, they knew the Bible better than probably any one of us know the Bible. They knew the Bible. And when asked where the Christ was to be born, they passed the Bible trivia question in Bethlehem of Judea. They knew it. They knew it, right? So they knew the Bible. They knew what was right. They were able to tell other people what was right. But they weren't interested in doing it themselves. You see these people? You know, the, you know what these people are like? It's like, do we ever see these people in our world? People who, who know what's right? who have the ability to tell other people what's right, but who won't do what's right themselves? Do we know these kind of people? We see them. We hear about them in the news. We rub shoulders with them. 
and sometimes we look at them in the mirror, right? I don't think any of us are exempt here, friends. That's why Jesus asks the very scathing question, why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I say? It's pretty tough, isn't it? These guys, these guys are just not interested in Jesus' story. They know what's right, but they're not interested. They're too busy with their own fiefdoms to be interrupted. You know what a fiefdom is, right? It's, it's this miniature kingdom. The fiefdom, a fiefdom is a miniature kingdom. It's a, it's a small, self-centered little domain. And it's like we humans are so apt to create fiefdoms. Like we gotta, we gotta, it's, it's part of, part of it I think is like a self-preservation thing. Because we don't see ourselves in the bigger story the way we ought to, we gotta write a story somehow. And so we create these little worlds and we put ourselves right in the center of these little worlds and that's what's important and that's what matters and we can't see beyond it. We don't wanna see beyond it. Sometimes like the Jewish leaders, we're just not interested in Jesus' story. We're too caught up. These guys are just too caught up in their own little worlds. They're thought to be people of the kingdom, but the demands of their own little fiefdoms overruled the needs of the kingdom time and time again. Again, here we are. Jerusalem is six miles away from Bethlehem. And we don't read of a single one of these Jewish leaders who join with the wise men to go down and worship the one born king of the Jews even though they knew that it was happening. They're, they just had too many important things going on. Busy schedules. It's just too hard for them. Right? They didn't want to be interrupted to travel those six miles to meet the long-awaited Messiah. And here's the scary part of this. They eventually opposed Jesus and his kingdom. They eventually opposed him. And it's scary because that's actually a, like a reality. Talk about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. That's a reality. Jesus said this, you're either for me or against me. There really isn't neutral territory that anybody can stand on for very long. At some point, you got to choose sides. At some point, you got to decide who's the king. These Jewish leaders later in the life of Christ are the very ones who opposed him time and time again and then eventually showed the same hostility that Herod did and were the ones who mocked Jesus while he hung on the cross and said, he is the king of the Jews. Maybe he should come down and save himself. Scary, huh? There's a lot of people like these Jewish leaders. They're just not interested in Jesus' story. They know the Bible. They know what the right answers but they're just too tied up. They're just too caught up in their own lives to be moved by that bigger picture. But eventually, eventually the conflict between Jesus' story and their story is going to come to a head. And they're going to have to choose sides. It's a good question, right? Like whose story are we supposed to be interested in? And then we get to the wise men. Then we get to kind of, if you will, aside from Jesus, they're kind of the heroes of the story here. The wise men saw their place in Jesus' story. And the truth is, they're a very unlikely group to be seeking Jesus, these magi as we know them to be. Here's a definition of a magi, a wise man. Any person respected in the pagan world for their knowledge in the occult arts, especially, especially astrology, medicine, and dream interpretation. A pagan... That's not a derogatory term. It's a, it's a defined term. A pagan is somebody who worships the earth and worships idols. And these guys not only worship the earth and worship idols, but they, they dabble in magic arts. These are the magi. These are the, guys that are, th- these are the guys who are coming from the east, likely Babylon. Babylon because Babylon was known to have magi. In fact, if you read the book of Daniel, Daniel was put in charge of the magi. So which because of the Jewish deportation, 600 years roughly earlier, they would have had had knowledge of the Hebrew Scriptures. So they would have known the covenants, they would have known the prophecies, so on and so forth. 
So there, there's, this is the type of people who would have studied these things and then supernaturally, miraculously, the star appears and God uses this, God is using this to draw these men to the Messiah. See, in our minds, we go, these are not likely people to be following Jesus. When you picture the stereotypical group of people who are going to be faithful followers of Jesus, you would not go, Magi, right? They're just not, they're just not cleaned up enough. But it's like here we are with Matthew again and again and again. We see it from his own conversion. He tells us of his own conversion because he's trying to tell us over and over again. It's not the, it's not the likely people that are probably going to follow Jesus. It's the unlikely people. It's all the people who recognize they don't deserve the grace of God. They don't, they don't, they've blown it and they know it. And they're in need of a savior. When you look at the genealogical record, it's why Matthew tells us about them. You got prostitutes and people who are pretending to be prostitutes, and you got adulterers and liars and murderers and all of these people who need a savior. And now we got the Magi. They need a savior. And who are they? They're an unlikely group. But what do they do? They res- they're resolved to find Jesus. If they're from Babylon, they traveled 800 miles. That's an 800-mile journey. If you could travel 20, out, 20 miles a day, that would take you 40 days. That's quite a journey. You're kind of going out of your way to find Jesus here, right? Which is a statement in and of itself. In contrast to the chief priests and the scribes who wouldn't go six miles because they're just a little too busy. This group is really willing to travel field and fountain, more in mountain, following yonder star. Don't you want to sing it? Right? They're resolved to find Jesus. And they recognized his majesty. They knew of these ancient promises, they, that God had kept his promise and fulfilled prophecy here. The one who's been promised has arrived. He's born king of the Jews. And if you're like me, you've got to wait a second. Why does that matter? Like if I'm not Jewish and I'm not a citizen of Israel, why do I care that somebody was born king of the Jews? It'd be like if I made the announcement that, hey, there was a new king in Malaysia born this week. We'd be like, well, we're not Malaysian, most of us, and we're not citizens of Malaysia. So why does it matter to us that there's somebody born the king of Malaysia? Same thing. Why does it matter that Jesus is the born king of the Jews? Well, because this goes all the way back to Abraham and to David, and to all of the ancient promises that the one who is born king of the Jews is the one who's born king of kings, Lord of lords. The one born king of the Jews is the promised one that takes us all the way back to just outside the garden when God said, I'm going to send a deliverer, and he's going to, and he's going to conquer the enemies of the human race. It's not an... It's not an ethnic thing or a national thing. It's a human thing. He's going to be the one who puts down sin and conquers death and is the king of all. He's the one to whom God has testified every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The one born king of the Jews is king of everyone, friends. (laughs) And we will not understand our place in his story until we come to terms with who Jesus is. And these wise men, they recognized his majesty. It tells, us, it, it tells us that when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, which again, I mean, you, there's so much that could be said about that. When you, when you find Jesus, when you truly find Jesus, it's a joyous occasion, friends. It's a joyous occasion. And they go into the house and they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him and opened their treasures and they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So they respond in worship. This is like a picture of what worship actually is. They're super happy, right? Beautiful words here. Rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They're super happy. They're just, they're so glad to know that the real king is on the throne, that the real king has come. They're, they're so glad. They're just exceedingly happy, friends. It's a picture of worship. And when our hearts are 
set right, when we're focused on what we're supposed to be focused on and we, and we are from our souls seeing Jesus for who he really is, friends, that's a joyous occasion. Even though things in life can be crazy, when you really are focused on Jesus, it's, joy is the natural fruit of that. Great joy. And so it's a picture of worship. They, they, they found him and were very happy, and they submitted to him. They bowed down. This is an act of submission. These wise men bowed down to this child because they recognized him for who he is, and they submitted to him. It's an act of worship, okay? Worship without submission is anything but worship. Let that sink in just a little bit. If we think we're worshiping, but we're not submitted, we're not worshiping. So they're super happy. They're submitted to him. And, again, natural outflow, they gave him what was valuable to them. It's just what they did. Nobody had to coerce them. Nobody had to talk them into it. They simply, they opened their treasures, their treasures, and they offered him gifts. And oh, there's so much that could be said about this, and it's probably for another sermon, and you've probably heard it before about what gold could represent as a gift fit for a king, and frankincense, a gift fit for, you know, a priest, and uh, the myrrh, and this could represent his death and his long future, and all of that. And you go, yeah, oh, that's great. But the truth is, they just gave him what was valuable. This is a natural outflow. They're super happy. Jesus, the one born king of the Jews, has arrived. He's our king. And we're submitted to him. And we're super glad about it. And we just open our treasures. It's a natural, it's just naturally what happens, right? When you know Jesus for who he is, this is what they did. And there's a lot of people like these wise men, right? There's a lot of people, they wisely see their place in Jesus' story. They go out of their way to find him. They know that he's the one on the throne and they're happy about it. And they joyfully give him their lives and what is valuable to them. So it's a good story, right? It's a good question. Do you see your place in Jesus' story? Do you see your place in Jesus' story? So we've gotten a lot about the Christmas story right, but there's those few details in some of our songs and some of our traditions that we haven't gotten quite right. Whether or not it was a silent night, it doesn't really matter. It's not consequential. And it doesn't really matter whether there was three wise men or two or 30. It doesn't really matter. We don't have to know that, but what does matter is that the Christmas story isn't just about Jesus being born in a manger. The Christmas story is all about who Jesus is. It matters immensely that we get that right. And so again, let's review our three big ideas so far in this series. First, Jesus' story is your story too. It's his story, but we're included in it. Secondly, knowing the story of Jesus' birth grounds you in God's plan for your life. We've got to know that story. We've got to really know what it means, who he is, and that grounds us, helping us to understand that our place is important, that we really are valuable. And then lastly, to understand our place in his story, that we have to come to terms with who Jesus is. We've got to come to terms with it. Okay? Jesus is not simply a great teacher. He's not a prophet of God. He's not some special person from history. To come to terms with something means to accept it as it is. Jesus is the king, friends. He's the king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the sovereign ruler over all of the universe. And it is by his power that all things are upheld. And if we want to understand our place in his story, we've got to come to terms with who Jesus is. So, He's the rightful heir to the throne of our lives. His story is the one we're to see ourselves in. His story is the one that we're actually to be interested in. But then we got these characters who kind of give us this picture of how people respond to Jesus. And I just think we should make that honest evaluation of who we most are like from this text. Are we like Herod? We just want our own story. We're just going to write our own story demand our way, do whatever we have to do to keep it going in that direction and just get aggravated and mad 
when people keep trying to interrupt it. I got news for you. If that's you, God's going to interrupt it. You can be mad at the whole world and you can be mad at God, but he's not going to leave you alone. He loves you too much. God will interrupt your story because it's not your story. <laughs> it's his story. All right. Are you like the Jews who are stuck in somebody else's story? Or the Jewish leaders who just are not interested in Jesus' story? Or are you like these wise men who saw their place in Jesus' story? Let's bow in prayer. And I want to work through some ways to respond. And you can reflect on this. Ways to respond. First, if, you, if you'd like to stop being the king of your own life and give Jesus his rightful place, the way to do that, the Bible says repent and believe. Acknowledge before God that you've sinned against him, that you've offended him and done him wrong. And then trust that what Jesus did upon the cross in his death and his burial and his resurrection was sufficient for you and that you could stand before God clean and upright on the merit of Christ and not your own. Repent and believe. Maybe you're the person who feels stuck in somebody else's story. You're living in a setting that is unhealthy. It may be vi verbally abusive. It may be physically abusive. Somebody else is trying to keep you in their story. And if that's you, with all of my heart, I would appeal to you, don't stay there. Don't stay in that story. Who could you talk to? Who could you talk to? May God give you sufficient courage. May this very moment you make a decision to say, I'm not, I'm not going to live in that story. It's not how God has intended me to be. Who could you talk to and when will you do that? Maybe you're that, in that place where you know the truth. You, you know the truth. You know what's right. But you really haven't been overly interested in Jesus' story. What adjustments could you make? What's something that you could do that would be an improvement in this area? And maybe lastly, in light of how the wise men worshipped Jesus, is there anything that you should change in your worship of Jesus? I don't think a person should hear a sermon like this and be unchanged. I think each one of us, I think each one of us should, should be determined to change in some way, some massively, and others, maybe you just need to make some adjustments. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word and for the work that your spirit is doing right now. I pray that you'll solidify that work and help us to respond to you, to know our place in your story by coming to terms with who you are. We declare, Jesus, you are Lord. You are King. And I pray that each one of us would be glad about that and that we'd have a Merry Christmas. We love you, God. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. Thank you for your attentiveness. I'm going to...